Alright, it's been a while since I did a Goodwill video. And it's been even longer since I did this one, because I did this like a month ago, and I'm only uploading it now. You may notice there's some things that are out of date. And the Goodwills have not been very productive for some time, but I'm having a crappy day, so we're going to go to the Dearborn Goodwill, the Big Goodwill, the Master Goodwill, and we're going to see if there's anything there. We're going to see if there's anything there that's interesting. Uh, it's a sad, cold day, so this might be a pretty morose video, but we'll see what happens. Seattle, the worst city except for all the other ones. Alright, first stop, collectible section. It's almost never anything neat these days. Just a tin man's hat, I guess. That was kind of cool. Here's something interesting. This is an answering machine telephone. Kind of an early one, I think. It sort of looks like it's got a pad lifted off a early post vesture bell set. I tried getting it open to see the tape mechanism, but uh, no go. So otherwise, it's just a boring telephone. They had some bones. In case you need some bones, they had that. Need some bones? They're available at Dearborn Goodwill. Six nine. So as usual, there's nothing in the collectible section. Let's move on. Every time I go here, I check out the power tools, and I keep wondering to myself if somebody's coming through and cleaning out the really good ones, because everything that's left there is just all kinds of weird, off-brand, third-party tool names, things I don't recognize, like the crustiest old Ryobis. An important factor when you're at the Dearborn Goodwill in particular, but really any Goodwill, you gotta check the go-out carts. The ones where they pre-stock stuff that are going out to the floor. There's a lot of stuff on here get snatched. You can see everybody's poaching from these things. It's just standard practice here. Everybody's doing the same thing I am, looking for the hidden treasures. And believe me, a lot of stuff never hits the shelves. It goes to these bins, it never gets out. I was standing here for a good several minutes trying to get in there and just no dice. If anyone ever figures out a way to turn Wii Fit pads into gasoline, the Dearborn Goodwill is going to be rolling in cash so fast their heads will spin. It's always weird the things you find that are useful in another galaxy. This is an ultraviolet light, but the bulb's missing, so as cool as it looks, it's absolutely worthless, and I wonder if this is anything more than just a battery and a pair of contacts. I always go through the cameras. For a long time, I was just looking for potentially interesting SLRs or maybe a rangefinder nobody had noticed or anything like that, but nowadays I'm interested in finding digital cameras that I might want to get, you know, interesting old vintage ones, and camcorders and that sort of thing, so I go through them a little more thoroughly than I used to, and there's always something interesting in there, but almost never anything I want to buy. This is one such thing. It's actually really cool. I kind of wish I'd picked it up now that I'm watching the video. I think it's gone by now. I've, I've actually been back since then, and it's a little mini DV camcorder, really neat shape. I don't know. It's, it's, it's cool. It's got a neat industrial design. Uh, the only problem is I'd probably have to find a battery. It'd probably set me back $30. It's really not worth it for mini DV. VHS camcorders at this point are thick on the ground. You can get them here any day of the week. Um, the only special VHS camcorder is the SVHS reporter from Panasonic. All the others are all exactly the same, so I don't even pay much attention to them when I find them. Okay, now here's something good. Nikon Coolpix 990. Those were really solid cameras. My first instinct was to just put it down and ignore it and start going through the other ones. But then I came back and actually bought it and I've since brought it home and taken pictures with it outside. It's a really wonderful camera. I'll go ahead and throw a couple pictures on here so you can see what I'm talking about. The image quality is actually really stunning. It's quite sharp and it's pleasant to shoot with. I actually really like it. For like six bucks, it was worth it. In fact, here's a bit of a fish that got away. This is a Canon G1 or G3. I actually always wanted one of these and for some reason I, I didn't, I just didn't recognize what it was. I even put it in the basket and then I didn't actually buy it. I don't know why. This here is the first camera I ever shot with, the SRT 101. Well, I had the 102, but that's what I got my start on. Wonderful camera, terrible lens lineup. Another one of those little flip-out palm camcorders, another mini DV. 
again, I didn't get it just because it's mini DV. I mean, who cares? Here's a camera that wins the award for early 2000s design. It's got the blue, it's got the silver, it's just Sony as hell. You wouldn't catch me dead with one of those. There's no way the image quality was any good. For the last couple months, they've had a couple of mechanical calculators here. In fact, this one's probably not a calculator, it's, I think it's just a stamper. Um, but the one next to it's certainly an adding machine, and I'm just so tempted to collect these things, but they're so big, they're so heavy, and I have no idea how to repair them. Now here's something truly detestable. This appears to be a little synthesizer, a MIDI controller, but it plugs into an iPhone. Or an iPad, I suppose, but it's a 30-pin dock connector, so... Yeah, that one goes in the trash. Now to be clear, I'm done being excited about Newtons, but I saw this, I thought, oh, is that a Newton? No, it's, it's, it's an award processor. But you can tell when it came out, because it was clearly meant to look like a Newton. I mean, it looks like a Newton. It clearly looks like a Newton. That is not a mistake. Here's an odd instrument, the Angel Care Pad. I didn't know what this was at the time. I've looked it up since then, and it seems to be part of a baby monitoring system. And I think it's meant to tell you if your baby died? They advertise it'll alert you if there's been no movement for 20 seconds, so... What does that mean? Here's something unusual. A surveyor's scope. I don't need a surveyor's scope. If I needed a surveyor's scope, it would have been pretty cool to find a surveyor's scope at the Goodwill. I don't need a surveyor's scope, though, so I didn't buy the surveyor's. There's a lot of Wacom knockoffs at these stores, but this one has the best name ever. The Han Von Graphic Pal. Absolutely wonderful name. For the last few weeks, there's been this tape duplicator there. It's absolutely boring. But every time you look at it, you think to yourself, oh, I want that. I guess if I was running a punk music label, it would be a wonderful thing to acquire. But other than that, like it's completely boring. And I guess that's why it's still there. I wish I had a use for it. Here's the best tuning dial on any receiver I've ever seen. Look at this. It's very, very simple. It's a single pulley, but absolutely beautiful. If I had room in my life for collecting VCRs, I would be all over this place. Look at this. Look at this behemoth, this absolute tank. I mean, every part of it looks like they cared about making it, and the pop top looks so much more satisfying than the front loading, and everything on it's still pristine. And the wood grain even looks good. I mean, everything about the design on this item is, is just perfect, but there's just nothing I can do with it and nowhere to put it. Okay, now this... This is something interesting. This is a Telos Zephyr, and it, it looks pretty boring. Digital network audio transceiver, there's a lot of things of that nature. They're usually for uh, getting Muzak or, or streaming MP3s from some service, but this, this is actually something quite intriguing. The network it refers to is not Ethernet or the internet, but the phone network. This is an ISDN audio encoder, a device that allows high quality audio to be sent over very long distances prior to the internet or its wide availability and low cost. This leverages a technology that was up and coming in the 90s. It was called ISDN and it was a digital telephone and data line. It was supposed to replace our ordinary copper phone lines, but it never really took, particularly in America. It did get picked up by businesses, though, and got used by radio stations, among other things. What it does is plug into the phone network via an ISDN service called BRI, which offers two 64 kilobit data channels delivered via phone line. It proceeds to bond them together and transmit audio, bidirectionally it seems, at 128 kilobits. This is pretty good on its own, but then it compresses it with, apparently, MP3. That offers even better quality. The application of this would typically have been to connect a radio station's transmitter facility to the studio, or to connect a remote station to the studio transmitter facility for audio to be mixed into the broadcast. These are absolutely fascinating and extremely important devices with absolutely no remaining consumer or business application. And that's a shame, because from the foreword in the manual, it seems like the people who made this thing really cared about what they did and moved mountains to make it a really great technical solution. Of course, the company's still around. It seems like they have a lot of products, so I guess there's nothing to cry about there. It is a shame that I have no desire to take it home, though. All right, finally, we check the keyboard section, where there's nothing other than a bunch of cheesy old wavetable synths from the mid-90s and 2000s that no one will ever love. With all the hardware sections of the store knocked out, now it's time to look at software. These days, the Goodwills are actually nice enough to sort the software, games, etc. into actual sections instead of just mixing them in with the awful audio discs. 
So I always check the ones in little cardboard sleeves. Sometimes they're interesting. And in this case, it is actually something interesting. Kidsoft Club. I wasn't really sure what this was at first, but I bought it on general principle, especially because the design of the outside was amazing. We always have a lot of stuff like this that's never going to be interesting to anyone ever. And there's another Club Kidsoft with another amazing design on the outside. Now here's a copy of Jane's Naval Warfare Collection. Here's Star Wars Battlefront, Tachyon the Fringe. You see I'm discarding all of these. I don't really have time for any game I've heard of. Yet another copy of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Those are thick on the ground. Here's Hot Wheels Velocity. I've actually played this. I ended up buying it, and it ended up being pretty fun. And then we just have some ancient tax or business software or whatever. All the games that show up here for PS2 and Wii and Xbox, they're always sports games, racing games. Here we got the good stuff. Legends of the Secrets. Oh, that doesn't sound like shuffleware at all. That Goodwill was incredibly packed and very unpleasant to be in. And didn't have much of interest. But I got a couple of sharer discs, so it was all worth it, right? So let's see if RePC has changed any. Does it look like we, it? Well, I don't think we've been here in like you know, a month or two. Maybe there will be something interesting here. Usually this one just has the same stuff every time we go in, but we'll see. Repeats is a wonderful place, but you never know when you're going to walk in there and find the worst that a thrift store has to offer. Non-inverter microwaves, slide projectors, television tuners, TiVo boxes. A lot of stuff that's just never going to be of value to anyone, which is weird, because I know the folks who work at this store, and they're pretty savvy. Maybe people are actually buying this stuff. Here we have some touchscreen displays. They actually have quite a few of them up there in different resolutions. They also had a couple of these absolutely gigantic Sony beta cams. I actually ended up buying one of these a couple weeks later. It's the one I'm holding here because it was just too beautiful for me not to buy. I needed to have it, especially at only $30. It was missing a lot of parts. I had to get a lens for it, which is not easy. I had to get batteries, not easy. And I still don't have any tapes, but it still beats one of these. This is a Panasonic SVHS reporter. Actually really cool, but... It's really strange. It seems to be in their professional line because it has the AG prefix, but it shoots on SVHS tape and it weighs about a pound. It's really plasticky. I have no idea how to explain that thing. For the second time in as many times as I've gone to this place, they had a whole box of someone's tapes reported at home, complete with spine labels, track listings, and so on. Mood lifter three, the royal toilet, killing me softly, probably seal crazy. This next one's incredible. Let's see what nice and easy is. Oh. Yeah, you go through all those. Yeah. Trust me, I will. There's something about tape cassettes. This happened with VHS to a point, but I think it happened more with audio cassettes. And it kind of didn't happen at all with CDs. And now one-time use media is pretty much gone, so I don't think it'll ever happen again. The concept of the person who takes something like this, some one-off mixtape, and decides to completely fully illustrate it and document what it is, it's, it's like they're making something for real, not just recording some stuff onto a portable medium, but they're creating something that's their work of art, and they want to personalize it and put something of themselves into it. That's really cool to me, and so every time I find someone's tapes at the RePC or, or at a thrift store, I'm really happy to see that somebody cared enough when they were making something like this to actually bother to put in these little personal touches. That's the sort of thing that I look for whenever I look for media that has somebody else's stuff recorded on it. I'm not trying to pry into their life or anything. It's just, it's good to see someone's humanity expressed like that in a way that I think the era of SD cards and Dropbox is really completely lost. Holy shit. I did buy it, and yes, it's exactly as bad as you think. Interesting relic here, Multi-Ad Creator 2, sort of a Adobe InDesign competitor from the turn of the millennium. Something for classic Mac OS, I decided not to pick it up because I just have too much desktop publishing software already, and $10 was a, a bit much. It says own a real piece of computer history, but I'm not sure whose history this is. Here's the big wall of boring audio gear. It's never anything interesting. It's never any 
you know, banging Olufsen stuff. It's just, it's okay. The speakers are nothing special either, and most of them usually have the cones punched out. They always have such pretty typewriters here. Look at this thing. I wish I had room to collect these. There's so many beautiful typewriters, and this place always has a bunch. If you have an eye for this stuff, you can spot a really good tape deck from a long distance away. Like it has a stunning color scheme. Needs belts, no sound output, as is a hundred dollars. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I don't who made know. it? Huh? Who made it? Iowa. Iowa, yeah. Okay. It's probably pretty good. Spoiler: We bought it. It was. Check out this monster dual VGA monitor. And then look at the buried lead. Twenty inch. Oh, holy shit! Twenty forty eight by fifteen thirty six. I've never seen one that would do that. I lamented in a previous video the loss of RePC Seattle's amazing as-is section. This is pretty much what it looks like now. It's just the same thing week after week, and all it is is some tired old digital broadcast and professional audio stuff. Uh, maybe a terminal or two, some miscellaneous data mangling stuff. Nothing really exciting ever shows up in this section anymore. This is a fascinating bin. Yep. You never know what you're going to find. It's... This is the most thrift store of all thrift store bins. Mm -hmm. It's completely okay. random. Most of the stuff in here is absolute garbage, and then you'll pick up some yeah. sort of fascinating it looks gem. Too good. And see, this is why I think. Oh, you know what this is? I know what this is. This is a barcode scanner, hun. Okay, so you hear this? Yeah. You know what that's doing? No. So you know what a barcode scanner, it's got the laser, and the laser has to scan back and forth? Mm -hmm. This one, when you press it, charges up a spring and then swings the mirror once. Oh, okay, that's cute. Yeah, click, click, swings back, forth. Of course, that is complete speculation based on me knowing how barcode scanners work, knowing what this thing feels like, listening to it. I tried Googling it to find some information and I couldn't, so it turns out I actually should have bought this thing, because it's gone now. Here's an original IBM PC Junior joystick. I don't have a Junior, so I didn't buy it. One box over, I found one in a very similar style, but a standard 15-pin game port, so I bought that. Interestingly, though, the one I got has slide switches to disable stick return to center. That basically means when you move the stick, it'll just stay where you left it. Uh, this one has these wacky little toggle flippers. I've never seen anything like those before. It's a neat feature. I, I guess it's for flight sims or something, but uh, it's just a really weird way to activate it. All right, so from there, I got the joystick. That's the one with the 15-pin connector that I just told you I got, but forgot to take footage of. Um, which, I, it feels really good, and I'm hoping to adapt that over to Tandy. So maybe I'll make my Tandy 1000 Adventures a little better. Um, this is very funny, and will be in a video on my channel later today, probably. I did actually put it in a video, Weird Stuff Exhibition, and I'll put a link in the description on this video. I got 3D shark hunting. No, that's, hang on. 3D hunting, shark. 3D hunting, and the variety is shark. Um, During the hunting game heyday. I got a wireless mouse, and then arguably what I'm most excited about is the huge box of tapes that I got, because it appears to be just someone's huge collection of mixtapes. All these person's mixtapes with like custom covers on them, where they drew like little full color scenes on the spine or on the face. Well, I can't find it, but anyway, there's one in there, it's just labeled Anime Tape 3. And it has, it opens with a uh, Cruel Angel Thesis. Wait, oh, did it? <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> Hang on, let me just... All right, so I found it. The uh, the tape I was looking for was Wrath of Anime 3. Okay, and show the track list. I thought it contained uh, Cruel Angel Thesis, but it does contain Fly Me to the Moon. Apparently, Wrath of Anime 2 would have contained Cruel Angel Thesis. Possibly. Possibly. Um, we also have, uh, this one here has Elvis, Six Degrees, Cinema Paradiso, and then Macross Robotech. <laughs> <laughs> Highly eclectic taste. Um, then we have uh, the most exciting one here, Outgoing Message Cassette, Endless. <laughs> really pumped about that. Um, and then... Um, the most Eggwood ass tape I've ever seen. The top 10 barbershop quartets of 1969 at the 31st International Quartet Contest of S-P-E-B-S-Q-S-A. Let's just, let's just look at that again. The 31st International Quartet Contest of S-P-E-B-S-Q-S-A. Jesus. 
South Pacific Eastern Barbershop Quartet shit ass. I don't know. I don't know what it means, but it's the, or as we colloquially call it, you know, the spibsequa. The spibsequa. The spibsequa. Spibsequa. Things have gone well so far, but we decided to take a trip to Burien in order to make them much worse. It's a Gravis Eliminator act there. It's like it's in jail. I'm leaving it in jail. Yeah. In the immoral words of everybody on Giant Bomb, don't buy a racing wheel. Every single thrift store has at least 15 VR headset adapters for smartphones. They are all over the place and they're worthless. You can buy this racing wheel though. This is the stick you need. Absolutely At first I thought it might be a TV video game, but it's not, so. I don't know if it's just a Burian oh, wow. thing, but this particular Goodwill always has a pump organ. They're in usually horrible condition. This one actually looks pretty good, but it looks really cheap and it doesn't really work. And I don't know where all these pump organs are coming from or why they're always so damaged. Here we got the good shit. Yeah, there you go. The only worthwhile thing in the entire place was this Nakamichi tape deck. Uh, if you've watched my stream, you may have seen me taking this thing apart because it's broken for the fourth time, but it is a really beautiful machine when it works. Every single Goodwill is absolutely awash in Wacom tablets. They always have tons and tons, never with the pen. This one finally has the pen. It's complete in bo Oh, Mark of the Beast. Now this is exciting. This is a Canon Lide Scanner, which I forgot to buy, and they don't work with Windows 10, and it's a shame because they have a claim to fame that, as far as I know, is unmatched. They run entirely on USB. No power supply required. I don't think they make these anymore. I wish they still did. I swear to God, this is just a vampire steak. I don't know what else it could be. It appears to just be for stabbing through someone's heart. I don't see any other purpose for it. They never separate the software from the music in the compact discs. So you have to go through every one of them just to find out if there's any software in there. And you can go through them three or four times and then still find stuff. And that was it. That's all the footage I have for this video. I didn't even turn the camera on when I was leaving because the software section was so unbelievably dismal, but I got depressed and went home, despite all the things I'd found that day. What a goddamn waste the Burian Goodwill is. They should just outlaw that thing.